Uh, welcome all. Have you had a long day? Well, it's about to zip through. Hope you've been enjoying IE Week. Uh, my name is Sumit Bose. I am the uh, founder of uh, Future Net Zero and Energy Live News. And it's my pleasure to host this session all about the gen, gen Z, X, Y, Z. I don't know what they'll make it. Special Generation 2050. That's right. So this is a session all about where will we be going? What will the next generation uh, be involved in? What do they want to see? And is big or small when it comes to energy companies or businesses the way to go when it goes to net zero? We've got a great panel today. Um, I'll just get them all to say hello very quickly. So we've got Adriana Martins from Arenka. Adriana, hello. Hello. Piotr Korn, I'm going to hope that hopefully I get this right. Konopka, have I got that right, Piotr, from DP Perfect. World? Perfect. Good evening to everybody from Dubai. From Dubai, hello. Kevin McCann from Solar Energy UK. Hello, good evening, everyone. Or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And then two uh, slightly more mature, we should say, members of the younger generation. Uh, Louise Kingham, VP's head in the UK. And Nigel Pocklington, who's the CEO of Good Energy. Nigel. Thanks, Simit, for the, uh, I think, acceptable summary there. So uh, good to be here. <laughs> right, guys, what we're going to be talking about is kind of Generation 2050. If you don't know what Generation 2050, we've got a slide I'll explain. It's um, a new initiative, really, founded by the Energy Institute's younger professionals uh, to give them a voice, because they'll be the generation that take us to 2050, where we all hope to be getting to net zero. Um, they have a manifesto, which you can see that they published in the run up to COP, uh, articulating their views. And it was uh, a manifesto uh, comprised of a thousand young any professionals voices. And they've made a great documentary, which we'll show a clip of at the end. What's this session about? This session about you, the audience, asking questions. So we really want you to get involved. Uh, the way you ask questions is you type in the chat button. So I'm sure you all know how to do that. Uh, there's a little kind of a speech bubble thing stick your questions in there and then we will get to them. We're going to have a conversation for a little while and then we'll start taking questions. So feel free to put them in, put them in the chat box as you go. We're going to run this session for about an hour, but really what we're looking for is your interaction from home, where you're watching, where your office is. Uh, we're going to have an in introduction to kind of everyone and, and their companies in a moment, but uh, we're aware that we're global. so. You know, we will talk a lot about uh, the UK and Europe, but we're happy to talk about uh, and bring questions from around the world. So maybe you're uh, watching from Africa or, or Asia and you have certain things you, you'd like to talk to the panel about, then do so. And particularly if you're a younger person, really want to hear your views, OK, because you are the generation that's going to take us to where we want to go. So any issues, remember to just message us, but uh, let's crack on with it and let's start with a little introduction from each person. So uh, we'll start again with Adriana. Uh, just tell us in a sentence a little bit of what you do and tell the audience uh, your stance on net zero, whether it's you or your your company, the way you want to put yourself at. Of course. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, Pietro actually mentioned he, he's in Dubai. I'm from London. Just want to emphasize because I feel we're all spread around. Um, so yeah, my name, Adriana. I've uh, working at, at Arenco Group. Um, I'm a junior data scientist, um, so on the tech side of the company. So as a quick intro, I guess, what means um, net zero for me? I guess I focus on more on the society and net zero in a society will probably be or mean that we have a more efficient society that uses their resources more intelligently and more unified as well and interconnected because I believe we kind of need to get everyone together, industries and uh, countries, honestly, and all work towards this goal. Over to you. Brilliant. Well, let's hand over to Kevin. Kevin. Thank you very much indeed. Hi, so my name is Kevin McCann. I'm the policy manager at Solar Energy UK. We are the trade body representing the UK solar and energy storage industry. What does net zero to me, mean to me? I think uh, net zero is a moral imperative. Climate change is a thing. It's real. It's happening. We need to address it. Um, it's also an opportunity to get involved in an unbelievably diverse range of uh, projects, roles and businesses working to address that, which I think is also fundamentally one of the most interesting things in the world. 
Piotr. Yes, thank you. Uh, Piotr Koropka here. Um, I'm a senior manager for energy and decarbonization programs at DP World. I'm based in Dubai, but I'm overseeing the global portfolio, which, which includes over 100 uh, terminals, uh, both ports and, and logistics side, but also close to a five, close to 500 vessels, which, which is an interesting topic when it comes to net zero. Uh, what does what, what does net zero mean to me personally? I mean, I do believe that it is the greatest challenge of the 21st century to to, to really mitigate um, climate change as much as possible. But also, I'm hoping that it's that I also hope that it's the biggest opportunity of the 21st century century to from from the financial perspective. Like I do not want to see another billion dollar company uh, which is all about sharing the pictures of your cat. I'd rather see innovative low carbon technologies that really kind of take center stage when it comes to, to comes to funding and implementation so, so pictures of yourself with a nice uh, hydrogen balloon on the selfie now absolutely right? <laughs> <laughs> um, just so people understand dp world uh, ports basically correct uh more than that uh so we are an end-to-end -end trade enabler what started off as, as a ports and ports business, we've now moved into logistics sites, economic zones, and uh, well, most recently marine marine services as well. Cool. Uh, Nigel. So I'm the chief executive of Good Energy, which is one of the original challenger energy companies in the UK. Think of us, I think, in three terms. We are a supplier of 100% renewable energy to homes and businesses throughout the UK. We're usually regarded by people like the Consumers Association and Beringa as the greenest supplier in the marketplace because we can back all of the consumption we sell back to purchasing agreements with renewable generators. But we are increasingly trying to become an energy services company aimed at helping those homes and businesses get to a much lower carbon position. And on the energy side, we are one of the originators of the feed in tariff scheme. So we're big players in terms of decentralized energy, inviting people to don't just use energy, but generate your, our energy, but generate your own. And through ZapMap, which we're the majority owner of, we are building an app to help people plan and pay for their electric vehicle journeys uh, with something that is used by the vast majority of UK's, the UK's uh, electric vehicle owners. And what's it mean to you, net zero? Uh, I think it's an imperative uh, and one that we should be um, throwing everything uh, getting towards. And, and it's a very achievable imperative, frankly, uh, for the UK. And I'd like to see the country um, sort of leading in this area. Cool. And Louise? Thanks, so Amit. And, and hello, everybody, again. So my day job is uh, head of country for the UK and senior vice president for Europe for the BP. Uh, and I joined BP just last May now, so very much classed as a newbie in that environment. Um, for the very many years I've been involved in energy, uh, I probably spent two thirds of that wishing that people would get more excited about the subject, in the industry, uh, and, uh, and, and for the last proportion overwhelmed, I guess, with uh, getting what I wished for. Um, and I, like Piotr has said, I think you know it is the biggest challenge of our time, quite rightly. But I also think it's a fantastic opportunity. And so, so for me, there is a, a, a having spent a lot of time advocating for doing the right thing and doing the best thing we can in the sector. Now I've got the opportunity. Uh, so what it means for me is that I can actually influence how we go about doing that. So I now work for an organisation that has said it is going to be net zero on or before 2050. And I live in the bit of the organisation where we focus on helping customers and the world uh, in, in many sense of customer on the journey as well. So there's many, many clever people inside the company already who are working on how BP gets to net zero. But my focus is is more external working with with others to to work out how to do that. Now, obviously, you know, this is going to come as a question to you. Here's BP. <laughs> Just for the audience, Louise and I know each other for a little while now. So, um, but look, the question people will be watching go, hang on, why is BP on this conversation for a start? A lot of people, you know, the whole International Petroleum Week is now International Energy Week. A lot of people say that, you know, large multinational oil companies like yourselves are the problem, not the solution. So before we start our discussion, how do you answer that point? 
Yeah, and you know what? It's a fair question. And um, having worked in the, the non-profit world uh, and particularly closely with uh, some some of uh, colleagues that are participating in, in what was IP week and is now IE week, it's 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 a really fair question and it's an important one because the answer to it is that organisations like PP have to go on the journey, not just for themselves as organisations to have be sustainable energy businesses in the future uh, and provide the opportunity that goes with, with along with that for very many thousands of people and communities and and the, you know the tentacles that it has, but but more so that the world cannot get there if sectors that are hard to decarbonise don't go there too. And so that's a really important role that, that and space that BP can help to fill, along with many others, um, in thinking about going where the emissions really are. It's energy, industry and transport, 70% of the global emissions. So it, BP can contribute an awful lot. And I wouldn't have come from the not-for-profit industry and environment, the third sector, into corporate life if I didn't believe that BP was all in and we had every every opportunity uh, and the will to to get this done. All right, this this discussion, guys, and, and start putting your questions in audience. So we'd like to hear from you uh, is big versus small. So, as I said, uh, just before we started the call, uh, this is all about the younger generation. Let me open it up to you guys. So Adriana, Kevin and and Piotr, and uh, you know, the slightly more mature of us will will, will add in. But what do you think is going to work? Okay, do you think it's going to be smaller companies, or will it be giants like the BPs of this world? Where where do you see it? Um, Adriana, why don't we start with you? Okay, great. Um, okay, the I hate I hate to do this, but I'm not going to give you a specific answer because I feel. <laughs> You're not um, already, I love no, it. it. Okay, I'll, I'll go in line uh, with what I said at the beginning, right? Um, I see it as a unified effort. So we require both big and small entities. Maybe I would say the a lot of the innovation and those quick actions that you sometimes require to prove concept or, or to show that it's possible will come from those small companies where they probably have flatter structures, less bureaucracy. Uh, you need to go to fewer people to get stuff done. Um, but as Luis was also saying, you need to consider the, the big companies, the big boys that have been around for a long time with big infrastructures uh, that might have the exposure to apply that innovation and, and, and reach more people, more customers and, and make that sort of transformation possible. So I would say a mix, but at different sizes of companies will have different roles, if that makes sense, and will contribute differently. Come on, young people, chip in. Go on then, I'll join. Um, yeah, I mean, the short answer, of course, is both. And I think, you know, I work in the UK solar industry. I think it's a really good example that the industry has come from, you know, borderline negligible solar deployment in the UK yeah. 12, 13 years ago um, to record subsidy free growth for last year. We just published our latest deployment stats last year, last week, rather. There was 730 megawatts of, of PV deployed in the UK in 2021. Um, and I think, one thing that, you know, again, speaking of the industry, I know solar, that I think some people still tend to think, for example, that solar is, is sort of solely relatively small um, electrical contracting firms uh, installing you know, small domestic or residential um, systems, which are incredibly important. And again, something people don't realise, there's already a million of those in the UK. But you've also got now utility scale plants being backed by, you know, huge institutional investors, hedge funds, pension funds and so on, bringing the capital and expertise of, you know, other big firms who are able to, 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 to help deploy things at scale. And that, of course, is going to be true of, of, uh, of all the various uh, sectors involved in, in, in the energy sector more broadly. Um, so, yeah, anyway, I'll pause there. That's an initial thought. Good. Um, I, I agree with Adriana that it's a combined effort because on one hand, I've seen some interesting research that since 1990s, 70% of global emissions came from 100 companies, a third from 20 companies. So they have a huge role to play. But I also do not believe that these companies themselves have all the solutions necessary to decarbonize 
besides seizing existence, but of course that's not that, that's not possible and very radical. So they, you know they they need to find well first of all of course the, all the solutions within, but many of them will come from from medium sized enterprises for small small sales size enterprises even from startups right when it comes to uh, comes to innovation and I guess it all depends on what big means. So you know. Uh, DP World moves 10% of the global cargo. So I think that's what's something that you would consider big. On the other hand, our carbon footprint is four and a half million tons per year. So comparing to the global of 51 billion, it's, you know, you, you can argue that it's not that small, but I think we, we, we can also act as an incubator for all these technologies. We do like listening to, to all these startups and, and, and including as much innovation as possible. So, uh, yeah, I think they all need to work in tandem. There is no, no one size fits all. God, you're not all radical, are you? Blimey. I thought someone would be tearing down the walls. Nigel, you were a radical youth, weren't you? Uh, oh, something like that. Yes, as you can tell, people call <laughs> Nigel off and off. <laughs> How do you see the play? I mean, you know, let, to explain to the international audience, you know, good energy, it, it really was one of those little things that came and knocked on the door, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, our, our roots are probably quite interesting for this discussion. So Good Energy was founded by my predecessor, Juliet Davenport, who is, uh, I saw styled in one newspaper interview the other week as the doyen of uh, British renewables. Um, and it was exactly that. It was crowdfunded money to help build a sort of larger scale wind farm on a farm in North Cornwall in the southwest of the UK for the international audience, which had already sort of been innovating in this area, but really didn't have much in the way of capacity. And it was absolutely that, a bootstrapped startup that really kick-started um, onshore development or onshore renewable development, I should say, in the UK. And, you know, with that came a subsidy package at the time. Move forward, it's 20 years now. Actually, we've been around 20 years, listed as a public company about 12. We've actually just sold all of the assets that all that bootstrapping went into building for the very obvious reason or, that, uh, you know, the world's moved on. And you know, all the power we were generating could frankly have been generated by about four large turbines in the North Sea. And it doesn't make any sense for a small business like us to have all that asset, all that cash tied up in those assets. And we're moving on and we're taking the proceeds for that and trying to invest in more innovative digital approaches to helping people get to, to net zero. So there's a sort of nimbleness around a company like us, which and we need to be, you know, targeting the early adopters, moving things on because there's nothing to be gained by somebody like me sitting there forever with a relatively small amount of generation thinking I'm doing my bit because actually that whole market's moved on now. But, but you, in a way you sort of disrupted, didn't you, an organisation? If you think about 20 years, I certainly remember 20 years ago I was at the BBC, there was no there was no environment correspondent, no yeah. one cared, right? And dare I say, uh, hopefully people get this around the world, but, you know, kind of um, the South West is where the hippies of the UK like to hang out. So it was seen as one of these things. That, oh, here's a bunch of people who like to uh, go out in the summer sun and then they want to build a windmill. And yet suddenly within 10 and definitely within 15 years, big, huge energy giants are doing the same thing all around the world. What, what do you think that that mindset of the and I know you weren't there, but, you know, you, you know about the company, obviously, mm -hmm. that mindset of making a change when everyone else was going a completely different way. That was a disruption, wasn't it? It was a huge disruption and, and a huge testament to, to my predecessor, frankly. You've got to be pretty determined to pitch yeah. up saying, you know, I want to raise some money because I want to go and build a wind or a solar farm. And then, I mean, arguably even more innovative, the thing we still do was to then say, and the other thing I'm going to do is find all the small independent generators out there and I'm going to be the, the company that connects them into the grid and actually you know maybe our more lasting contribution is the fact that there were there are 1900 generators working with us who collectively supply enough power to power my home city of manchester now and you know um and that again has sort of led to a huge footprint and almost the thought that anybody a farmer uh an asset a company somebody a community can can get involved um, and you know we've got everything from solar panels on social housing in Bristol, which is a city in the south of the UK, through to hydro generation, through the irrigation of uh, a flower grower in Worcestershire. So we've got this real sort of network of pioneers who are keen to move move on. And I suppose collectively you would say 
that commitment to renewable is now reflected in the overall state of the grid, which of course is, is only, we've only got to about a 40% renewable grid in the UK because eventually the big players with huge capital get involved. Let's turn to one of those big players. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't disagree with anything I've heard. I think it, it's all sort of eminently um, right. Uh, and I think the only the, the things that I'd add are, uh, I think big and small can learn from each other. Actually, um, we've certainly and you've talked about solar a couple of times. You know, we have the partnership with LightSource, fantastically entrepreneurial, agile, fast moving, not only technology in terms of deployment, but just culturally in, in, inside the organisation. And there's a lot that the bigger bits of machinery inside BP can learn from that. I think there's also uh, a little bit of sentiment around inside very big organisations, you have lots of small ones because there are actually lots of almost separate entities inside very large organisations. So they are both in some ways big and small. Uh, another example I would lend is that many people don't know that actually BP has got a very active venturing uh, business and an incubator business. So we have got, uh, for example, alongside our partnership with LightSource, we've also invested in an AI company to do um, smart building management optimization using uh, a company called GridEdge that's been building out really, really quickly. And obviously, that's do dealing with energy efficiency as well as taking out the emissions. So I think whilst we might seem to be actually on the surface really, really different, and there are some structural differences, you know, scale does bring certain things. Scale does bring financial uh, capability, as Nigel says. Um, but actually, with, with this challenge, everybody needs to bring something. <laughs> There's no, no single balance sheet, no single entity that can, can do this without the collaboration of both big and small. I think the other opportunities that, that big organisations can provide maybe is around sort of talent development opportunities, which smaller companies can find difficult to, to, to do. And there's an opportunity again in thinking about how big companies work with their supply chains to build those in a sustainable way and create opportunities for people to move around within that ecosystem and develop their really exciting careers in energy. And there's something also there about how that's done fairly and how that gives people opportunity that don't necessarily have it now um, and transfer their skills and move from one space to another. You know, we had, uh, I think recently, we advertised for 100 hydrogen jobs in the business and 100 wind jobs. We had 10,000 applications. I mean, we were inundated, completely inundated, and a lot of that was good quality. So, you know, there's, there, there are some fantastic opportunities, I think, by big and small uh, working working in tandem and also learning from each other. Um, let me t turn to the, to the younger people. I mean, I started my career in a local small newspaper and then eventually I joined the BBC, but I'd never have joined the BBC to begin with. It's too big. And frankly, I'm, I really wish I hadn't, but hey, that's another story. Well, you know, you guys, when you talk to your friends and colleagues now, and Piotr, you're, you're in, a, in a big company, but for the other, I mean, where do they want to join? Well, you know, when you look at people, particularly Adrian, you're one of the youngest, right? So your friends that are younger than you at uni, are they looking at going, well, you know, where, yeah, I'll go to a big BP, or are they thinking, no, if I want to be something in climate, I want to look at something different because I know they might let me be me more yeah um no exactly i was gonna go uh there i know louise said and and i i agree we as professionals are probably more exposed to how can i say the whole supply chain or or the different sort of areas more if we do join a bigger company because there's that that structure and the different teams um however i believe maybe with small companies and disclosure i am in a small company let's say arenko uh, we are around uh, 60 now and uh, i'm also a young professional i feel the exposure i have here um maybe exposure no but maybe the uh, i would say the responsibility i'm given um it's it starts so early on that maybe it's let's call it small companies are sort of like the hub and accelerator of young professionals um, perhaps I'm in a state or I feel more prepared to deal with other sorts of projects or situations that if I were in a small company because of a bigger hierarchy and bigger teams, I wouldn't. But obviously that's not that won't be the rule. Uh, there's obviously exceptions. That's the way maybe I see it by talking with my colleagues, my friends and other people in industry. 
Um, but I guess that kind of in a way speeds up the, the young professionals route and not saying that we are required, but I guess as big and, and small, both are a combined effort and are required. I think different expertise, different backgrounds and even le different levels of expertise um, are all useful and, and should be part of the net zero. Uh, and in a way, I guess the smaller companies give that exposure and prepare younger professionals maybe to be ready for other situations and lead uh, sooner rather than later, if that makes sense. What about your friends? What, what, who, are, If they're interested in this world, are they doing like you, joining smaller companies or, or what? Um, so I did uh, my master, I, I focused my master's already on something very specific to energy. So a lot of my friends from my um, graduate uh, program are in the industry. So I have quite a big network um, working in a variety of different companies, EDF, Octopus and so on. I would say that in general, that's, I guess, the opinion that smaller companies give you more exposure or more responsibility, let's say. Um, but obviously, small companies won't have those big graduate programs like you see on BPs, uh, ExxonMobil and Totals, for example, um, that you get to see, as we said, the commercial, the supply chain, the, the actual technical uh, bit of a, of a company beginning till end. Um, you don't get that on small companies. Um, but you might give, be able to do other types of jobs or lead specific projects more early on um, compared to if you were in a bigger one. Who else wants to come in? Yeah, I, I'm happy to. So I, I actually started my career in consulting. So I've, I've, I've done that for, for, for six or seven years at a kind of a mid-sized company called Guidehouse. I did mainly kind of energy projects. So that, that was a fantastic opportunity to just understand how the industry works all the way from governments to big companies, startups, small companies. Uh, fantastic learning curve, you know, like I couldn't recommend consulting enough for kind of young graduates just to understand the breadth of, of, of the energy industry. But at the same time, I've, I felt like maybe it's, it's, it's time to stop learning and, and, and finally graduate. And that's why last year I've, I've moved on to to, to a large company and to, to, to me the biggest appeal of it is is simply the scale like to be able to manage a global program you know as I mentioned of over 100 different sites um, you know all, all continents of, of, you know 50 plus countries that, that that we are operating in with all the kind of cultural differences and technological challenges you know all the way from the, the, the access to electricity, to, 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 to heavy regulation. I, I, I just find it fascinating. Uh, in terms of my peers, I, I don't know, I just, when I interact with the young people, I don't see like that much interest in joining large companies, especially in like in, in conventional roles. Like, don't get me wrong, they will apply for it because the job market is tough and, you know, an average graduate sure. said, yeah. God knows how many CVs, 100, 200, 300. So they will apply for anything that comes along. But I think, uh, well, areas like decarbonization, energy, net zero could be the, the, the ways for actually large companies to do it, to, to attract that young talent. They don't want to work in a boring operations job, but it's just so, so exciting. You know, if everybody's talking about it, you want to you, you want to follow the trend and that, that is the trend. Um, yeah, well, uh, one thing to add, I suppose, is one one dynamic that we've not necessarily alluded to directly is that small companies can become big companies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so. I've worked at two or three, you know, relatively small places so far in my career. And what's really interesting and exciting is to to grow with them um, and to help develop the systems, processes, policy support um, that is commensurate with that. I mean, to take my current role with UK Solar Energy energy industry is growing very rapidly um, and we're growing with that and, and that, you know we're expecting very significant growth in the next 10 years and as a trade buddy that's incredibly interesting because we're trying to think through um, how best to support the industry to support government and to support incoming members of the industry to develop in a way that is sustainable um, from an industry that's you know seen its ups and downs over the last 10 years as government support and and other you know uh, dynamics that have 
sort of swung up and down. Um, and that, that's phenomenally interesting. One of the most interesting aspects of my role is that, as I alluded to previously, we've got members that range from very small companies up to you know very, very big companies backed, as I said, by institutional com- uh, capital. And they've got very different requirements in the trade body as well. They want, some of us want us to be talking to government on, you know, the sort of the big macro level issues, of, you know, renewable power auctions, for example. Others are looking to, um, you know, they've, they've got challenges at a very local level relating to, you know, particular how solar installations connect to the grid and want us to help talk to the the, the distribution networks, so, you know, the, the parts of the electricity system. Um, and that sort of variety is, is, is really, really interesting. Um, Finally, I would just say that the other good thing, as, as Adriana alluded to, is that working for a small organisation, you really do get exposed to, to absolutely everything. In a, in a past life, I used to work for NGOs um, and spent some time researching the oil and gas industry in West Africa. Um, and you, you get so involved in, you know, running projects, running budgets, managing things, um, talking to government, liaising with other organisations, building relationships. Sure, the actual, for example, amounts of money you might be working with are, are relatively small, but the actual issues are exactly the same, I would contend. And, and, and they really force you to get the basics of project management right, um, which I hope will, will serve me and you know others in similar roles well in, well in the future. And again, I think that that partly comes from working somewhere small that gets bigger. I just want to ask you something, Kevin, but isn't it more fun to be in the small organisation where you, maybe you would be, like, say, Adriana smiling, you've got people who are kind of your age, you've probably got radical bosses like me, I'm a radical boss, who's like, go and go for it. And, you know, Louise is laughing. Um, but that that is, you know, that's where you kind of feel that you can really do something. And why do big firms struggle these days sometimes to find people who really, because they want that, they want, I suppose, mix, you know, your generation definitely want to be expressive, but obviously you, you, you look for security as well. Uh, so, so, I mean, to be clear, I don't have a baseline to compare against because I've never right. really worked anywhere really big. But the short answer is yes, I've absolutely loved my career today for precisely that reason. And I suppose, you know, you, the question about peers, if I've got an idea, fundamentally, I go to my boss. Um, collectively, we agree if it's a good idea or not. And my boss will then go, OK, go away, make it happen. Come back in 12 weeks and tell me what you've achieved. There's not even, you know, I talked to, to some of my friends working in, in larger organisations and they say it might, 12 week, might take 12 weeks even to get sign off on the idea of doing the idea. So I've never come up against that. But yeah, fundamentally, it's, it's phenomenally good fun. OK, Louise, I, I can see you, you're going to go now go to Nigel as well after this. Go on, Louise. Yeah, no, no, I just, you know, it's really interesting listening to this, the, the, the subtle, the differences in, in, in the conversation. But I, the, for me, the golden thread that runs through this and, and one of the reasons why I think the Young Professionals Network of the, of the, of the EI is, is so powerful is that, you know, we are net zero is a fantastic way to be very purpose driven. Right? So we are looking for uh, those of us that are motivated to rise to this challenge and see the opportunities in it is because we have a sense of purpose. That's what's getting us out of bed in the morning. Uh, and, and that's you know, certainly I see that in the young professional networks and the generations up there. But I also see that in, in some of the rest of us, too, uh, in terms of that excitement. And I think that's about that's about alignment of values, isn't it? In terms of, of whether or not we, we get that common purpose and we sense that this is a place where we can show up as ourselves be ourselves, have the space to contribute and make that difference that's so important. So so I think as opposed to while we've talked about big and small, I think we also make choices about the culture that we want to survive and thrive in and whether that's an inclusive and a, and a, and a, and a safe environment where we can be ourselves. And what I love about the young professionals uh, community is that you know, give this community voice and they tell you how it is. And as a leader today in an organisation, if you're in listening mode, that's incredibly powerful. Uh, and together you can you can have a real impact. So you know, maybe it's not just big and small, but it's younger and maybe a little bit older too, where there's some value to be had when we think about culture. Nigel, someone comes up with an idea and then you say, put it on the back burner for 12 weeks. No, we wouldn't dream of doing that. Uh, <laughs> of ideas. I think the interesting thing to think about is the parallel with where I spent most of my career, actually, which is not energy, it's digital technologies, digital platforms. Right. Yeah. And the thing about that world, which I really liked, is you could not be 10 years more experienced than me because the thing didn't exist. Um, and so you had a whole generation of people in quite senior jobs quite early in their careers because, frankly, who else was going to do it? And, you know, 
net zero new energy technologies has a similar feel to it, frankly. You, you know, it, it is a fantastic opportunity for somebody to get very, uh, you know, read up and, and very knowledgeable about a subject area and that what they won't find is that somebody's done it all before because you know until a few years ago it wasn't particularly a consideration so there was an extraordinarily compelling reason to try and build a career in this area i think for that reason alone all right but before we go we've got some questions all right let me just ask the slightly older older ones nigel and louise if you were starting your careers again right now would you join a big or small company I would join. I would join a country. I would join a company which was the right fit for me. Yeah, I'd, have to, I'd have the opportunity in the space to do the things that I wanted to do. So for me, and it and it having done having uh, so Adriana's point about you know there is space to shine when you're in a yeah. small organisation. I have absolutely directly benefited benefited for that from a number of years. So I would certainly advocate for that, and I think it's a it's a great way um to both get that breadth of opportunity that she talked about earlier as well as the opportunity to stand out a little bit and be a bit different um but i think in a, if you go to the right big organization culturally you do get that same kind of opportunity um there's lots more people clearly but actually there's similar in my short experience of very big company life uh there are a lot of parallels but it, it comes back to that point of culture Mm, it's a political answer that one. No, I think it's an important really? one. Actually. Really? Uh, and uh, I would be quite personal about it. I mean, I would join somewhere where you think you're going to learn something and learn something from somebody you want to to work for. And when I mean, you can visit, certainly in the technology sector, small startups, you get yeah. to in as yeah. well. And they're an it's anarchy, and that you know, one or two people might uh, thrive in that, and they might be the big next big thing. Alternatively, it could be quite frustrating and you're not really going to you know, learn much. I mean, I'm more than happy to be public about the fact that um, you know, my career started at McKinsey, which is everyone's idea of a sort of risk averse blue chip choice. But it's an amazing place to learn how to be in the workplace and how to influence people and build a case. And I have never regretted it for a minute. No, well, things are changing. But of course, the idea that you have to be trendy and have a beard, particularly in the UK culture, that's very in. Uh, and then when you, you, know, you need to be in the corporate world wearing a tie, no. Uh, let's do some questions. Remember, keep them coming in, uh, ladies and gents who are watching. Uh, so here's a question that's come in. So from this person, it says, from my experience working with big and small question, uh, companies, they talk different languages. Oh, yes, that's for sure. Uh, a generational divide between Gen Z, Gen X, Gen A, B, C, D. Right, come on then. Uh, let's start with Pieter on that one. Yeah. Uh... I th well, I think they should continue speaking different languages. I mean, big and small companies have, have a different role to play. I mean, I would say big companies like utilities, like BP and so on. I mean, imagine what would happen if nine in 10 failed, like, like, like in startups, like the economy would be in absolute shambles. So we need them to be a little bit more stable, predictable. You need pension funds to invest in them and so on. On the other hand, this is not the language or the culture that would ever work in a startup, you know? Uh, you want startups to 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 you know let you run with the ideas. You, you want startups to take risks, and you know you want this one in ten to 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 make it big. So I don't think it's 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 bridging a gap between the communication. I think the way for them to work together, and and you know, Louise has mentioned that, and I think a lot of big companies are very successful in it. Is let small companies incubate in big companies, and I think that's the way to bridge the gap and you know they may be speaking different languages like this this relationship may, may not work but on the other hand it, it may give a solution that a big company would have never, otherwise never found but that's that's the apple model right if you you guys are <laughs> yeah. enough to have read the the apple story and he created you know the, the map but you know what doesn't something get lost because once that small company where people dress appallingly like me and then they suddenly get bought by a big company that's what's going to happen they're going to say well, hang on kevin you can't wear that stripy uh j jumper anymore you're gonna to have to do this actually yes. i i guess wait kevin i I just wanted to add a comment or maybe go a bit again what pietro said because i feel like in my company coming from clean tech uh, we we start so we are expanding now and we start to have more senior people coming from different industries to contribute and help us and within the company as individual professionals I see sort of a different language sometimes in team calls and so on 
And it is a bit frustrating. And honestly, I don't think we should have this difference and this gap um, because we should all learn from each other. And I guess this way, what I will say is, I guess the more senior people could have the, well, I'm sure they have the ability to to keep that learning coming and understand what that in this case uh, specifically, because I feel there's a lot of misunderstanding there on the tech side, keep up to date with the tendencies and what's happening. So I'm going to give a quick example. So a lot of um, my company, Arenco, we optimize batteries and we do a lot of the trading and a lot of the PNL reporting and so on can nowadays be automated with simple coding language, for example, as Python. Python. Someone senior in a company. I have no um, idea what that is. That, to me, that is a snake. Okay, exactly, exactly. So <laughs> think of it as, yeah, programming language. So um, if we try to automate that in our own way, like let's say the, the youngest way in Python, um, but the senior person maybe is used to Excel and he just says, I don't want this, this because I need to open a different type of file that I'm not used to. I, I'm but used I'm to trying this. to make the case. <laughs> I try to make the case that is a lot more useful and quick. And um, I guess it takes time to get that momentum in teams where the, the, there's different expertise and different levels. So, yeah, yeah. Kevin, be great to I do like your jumper, by the way, Kevin. I, I wasn't slagging it off what I'm wearing. But so. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah, a few points in no particular order. Funny enough, I was actually talking about this today. I, I pick up on the point that Louise made previously about making sure that the place is the right fit and, and the culture. Yeah. Um, to give you an example, as I mentioned, I used to work for charities and NGOs. And uh, they're generally, I think it's fair to say, they've got slightly more sort of progressive working practices. So, for example, way pre-pandemic, I could work from home when I wanted. And my peers working in right. much more traditionally corporate roles would say to me, does your boss trust you to work from home? I would say, no, he trusts me to do my job full stop, irrespective of where I am. Why would you employ someone if you didn't trust them to do their job? Fast forward two, three years, of course, we're all sitting here on a Zoom, uh, on a, you know, on a, on a remote call in a way that I would suggest would have been much, much less likely uh, two, three years ago. I think fundamentally that also applies to the language you speak, the clothes you wear, um, you know, every other facet of how you interact with people. Um, there's a time and a place for everything, but you, you sort of, so the other point I would say is the thing that I always try and do is make life as easy as possible for my colleagues. If I know that someone would rather have something in Excel versus Python versus on a on a on a post-it note, I will try and do it in the way that I know they want. And I would hope, of course, that they would do the same in return. And I think that's just about having, you know, a a, a, a collaborative working culture. I mean, reasonable people can disagree on how you get from from, from one end of the alphabet to the other, but if, you know, or the goal, let's say, but as long as you know where you're trying to get to, I'm trying not to speak in jargon now, but um, but I'm failing. So I'll, perhaps I'll just be quiet <laughs> and pass over. No, no, but look, look, I'm exactly that, right? So what you've just said is that, uh, of those things that you mentioned, Python to me is a snake. I don't know how to use Excel. I can just about use a post-it note. So I've got young people and I say, right. So you said a brilliant thing, Adrian, which is you guys can sort of adapt but dare I now turn to the slightly older ones? Uh, I'll start Did with I one one How do we respond to them? No, well, I'm sure people can adopt. And I think there's so many platforms and ways to actually learn and be up to date with the tendencies. Maybe they're not as known, but there is a possibility there. And I guess just spread the word and, and give that confidence to more expert people or senior that they can adapt. Uh, you're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> Louis, let's, Louis, someone says to you, I'd like to send you a message in Python. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I would also be thinking snake before anything else. But I, I think that the, the answer to your question from my point of view is that that's about the style of leader you are, right? So yeah. if you are up for listening, if you are up for learning, and if you are up for being you, showing up as yourself, I would say... So what's Python then? Explain to me. Well, I'm never going to get that. So how are we going to communicate in a way that's really, really going to help us both? And I would never profess to have all the answers, right? And I and I think that is what's important about leadership today. That earns the respect of the leadership that we're looking to try and encourage for tomorrow. Um, and I, I I think you know the days of these sort of leaders who would show up as if they knew everything should be uh certainly in my experience it's long behind us but it, that should be most people's experience now hopefully uh nigel python man or pascal uh, <laughs> i do know what both of them are I, I should declare my interest here i suppose i'm a hopeless gen xer here um 
And I did once stand in front of a, a team I just inherited when the World Cup was about to start. And I, uh, yeah. uh, I sort of thought I would be authentic and talk about a personal experience, which for me was England's narrow failure to make the final in 1990. We which, all remember you know, it well. Believe That's me, is you know the scars haven't yet healed. And I, I was halfway through this anecdote, and I thought it was been quite amusing. Before I realised that most of the people I was talking to were about three years old and but weren't even uh, watching the television. So I've learned from that. I hope. Um, I, I do sort of take quite a lot from uh, somebody I worked with for a long time. Uh, he was a, something of a mentor. Who was uh, well now Dame Marjorie Scardino. Who again, this is ancient history for some people, but she was the first woman to be a CEO of a FTSE 100 business. She yeah. ran Pearson PLC, which is a publisher um and actually her insistence was on clarity of and communication amongst above anything else and it would be drummed into us in a very friendly way but you know everything from don't use the passive voice to could you have used 20 fewer words and actually i still sort of stick by that even today i think you do need to be a very sort of authentic and listening ceo and if you don't understand it just say so but actually you can help people if your career has been hopefully built somewhat on clear communications in emphasizing the importance of that. And I do think the energy industry, whether renewable or not, has something to learn in that regard. So, you know, if you were to compare it to other sectors, yeah. sure. I think it probably is a bit of an outlier in terms of excessive use of jargon uh, and an awful lot of clever and sometimes brilliant engineers who are occasionally guilty of kind of wondering why the consumer isn't using their beautiful creation as opposed to the other way around. And that maybe is something that the sort of digital world, um, uh, which traditionally is associated with a younger demographic, can, can teach the energy business. Uh, questions come in. Should more organisations support reverse mentoring? I don't, need, to be honest, I don't even know what that means, but maybe I'm sure you guys probably do. And that, how means, that means you get an education, so oh, yes, right. exactly. Yeah. The answer to the question is I do it. <laughs> So should should they be doing that and how can companies get this right? OK, so reverse mentoring, uh, seeing as Louise knows, I'll start with Louise and then I'll go to Kevin on that one. No, well, absolutely. Yes, of course. Uh, and and not just reverse mentoring, but the, the point that was made about the skills or the things we don't understand, but we're interested to learn. That's also an opportunity to be mentored, uh, whichever way around that goes. So, yeah, I would always be an advocate for the answer to that being yes. Kevin? I mean, yes, I agree, basically. Sure, Why, what, learning should go in all directions, all the time. Um, so, yeah, that's very simply my response to that. Would your boss say yes? Pardon? Would your boss go, go with that? Pietro, in your organisation, what, what would happen if you said, hang on, boss, something you need to sort of learn from me? I, I think it would be OK. I mean, and again, to defend myself a little bit against what, what Adriana said, because I, I mean, I, I fully agree with you. My, my comment was more about kind of the culture of the, on the of, about the organization, not the internal communication. I'm, I'm fully with you that that gap between, you know, the older generation joining a company and the younger generation must be bridged. And I think just like when a child is born and, you know, doesn't know all the social norms and then learns slowly, I think exactly the same thing happens to young graduates joining the corporate world and the, and the way they somehow start getting molded. So, you know, I would basically advise all the young professionals here to, you know, just stay reckless and, you know, speak your mind, see what happens. You know, if you're not being, if 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 your voice is not heard, maybe you're not in the right organization, right? It's it's a difficult it's a difficult question to, to 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 answer. And same thing to to senior leaders, like listen listen to your people. Like just because someone's questioning you, it doesn't mean that they're trying to be rude. They're just trying to, you know, create positive change in the organization. So uh, I mean, I DP World is, is quite entrepreneurial. Uh, I, I do feel the freedom to to speak my mind, but on the other hand, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not that junior <laughs> anymore, so yeah. hard yeah. hard to really judge. Well, you know, what would happen if an intern spoke up? Yeah. What about if an intern speaks up to you? What would you do to them? Oh, no, I I'm, I'm I'm perfectly fine to listen. Uh, I will always listen. You know, it it, it it depends on what what they say and whether there is any content in <laughs> in, in what they're saying. But I, I'm always willing to listen. Um, take take feedback on board and you know elevate it up if necessary. Adriana. Well, uh, I think reverse mentoring is just a fancy word to well two words in this case, just to say that we have responsibility. Uh, we have uh, open communication and two-way feedback. And I guess 
once that's implemented in a team and with respect, obviously, it's sort of automatic and in I honestly think should always happen. Um, I'm quite pro communication and, and transparency, but I do believe there's a lot of learning coming from my manager, my senior, especially to young professionals like me in this case, there's a lot to learn and uh, I will be learning my whole profession. But for example, in this more, in this specific topic, like tech and, and all this n new things coming in the industry, maybe I could be the one teaching. Um, but again, uh, with open communication and respect, I think it's something automatic and yeah, we all greatly benefit, in my opinion. Uh, I think that's a fair point. I think, um, Nigel, what's your take on the whole way that, uh, you know, younger people, how, how do we, as the older ones, not do our 1990 red rum and all of those sort of uh, uh, British, uh, particularly British uh, uh, <laughs> historical context and, and start to think, actually, they're, they're doing it something, as you said, this is a new world, net zero. So they probably have got as much input in a different way than, than we have with all our experience. Well, I think then the obligation is on me, uh, certainly in my company, to create a culture that allows that two-way exchange that you know that sort of celebrates an uh, um, you know an ability to dissent from anywhere in the business and it, it I think I mean it's not a sort of radically new idea I would say that the best organizations I've been involved in in the past sort of 15 years I spent a long time uh, as part of the team taking hotels.com from a sort of unloved part of Expedia to being a big sort of global hotel booking brand and we had a very flat organizational structure and we absolutely encouraged an environment that um, uh, was sort of, you know, curious and, and driving after performance, but was very mutually supportive. And it created an environment where where people where anybody really could could speak up. And that feels to me to be what you should aspire to. I think reverse mentoring can have a role in this because it sort of sets a tone for the organisation that we're sort of taking this seriously. But it's more around, I think, achieving you know what many companies are these days which are not sort of top-down organizations where you kind of you know do your time and then hope to get promoted in five years it's yeah and I, you know i i think most organizations now have moved beyond that um anyway and it, it, sort of the obligation is on the senior team really to to help champion a culture that supports that um a couple of quick questions before we go because we're, we're getting out of time here but this one i think is a good one so I'll start with the younger people on this. Big companies, someone's written in, big companies uh, such as the super majors, oh, oh, Louise, have known about fossil fuel damage on the climate for decades. Now it's all good PR. They're all saying they're net zero. They're concerned for the, the planet, but it's all bloody, bloody, blah. They're really interested in profit, whereas small companies seem to be run by people who genuinely care. So why, we, why would we join a bigger one? Because, uh, you know, you'd, you'd feel that you're actually getting someone genuine in a smaller company. Um, let's start with Adriana on that one. Okay. I was wishing I wasn't the first one. Obviously a tricky one. Okay, fine. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take that for a bit, Samir, okay. if you could give everyone some thinking stuff. Go on, go on, yeah, go on, I'll, I'll take on that. Nigel, you start then. I was going to politely criticise the question there a bit. I think, I mean, you know, I run a small company. We're, we're listed on AIM. It's the smaller yeah. market in the UK. I care about profit because a profit profit is freedom profit is the freedom to invest mm. it makes people support the company and i i do think and i find myself doing this quite a lot actually um that the sort of underlying principle is a perfectly noble one we have to provide something that people see a value in absolutely uh, give us uh, more than, and sort of the thought that profit in itself is a bad thing i think is, is very probably, i think the person asking the question i think it's all about the greenwashing isn't it yeah Suddenly, they're all jumping on it so uh kevin you know so joining a big one that suddenly is you know your next job and they've been greenwashing for years would you go uh so i think if if those companies are part of the problem then yeah. what flows from that is they have to be part of the solution the question really i think for an individual is whether you're convinced that they are heading in the right direction to travel and whether you joining them will mm. help accelerate that direction of travel. Um, I agree with what, I violently agree with what Nigel just said. I think um, it's perfectly reasonable to make a dent in the world by working for a big corporate um, that is making money, 
paying people uh, and treating them decently and not in fundamentally incurring harm in the course of their business operations. And I think the problem today is not all companies have successfully managed all three, notably in terms of incurring harm in you know any number of different ways. Um, the world is a complicated place. And I think if you are satisfied that there is a clear trajectory towards actual action, actual definable things that a company is doing that can be measured to reduce harm where that's previously been shown to taking place or to move towards, you know, in this case, net zero, then I think, yeah, I, I, I would consider it, sure. Well, uh, Louise. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you know, I, I think that the question is a fair, it's a fair challenge, right? And I, and it's certain I can just reflect with a slightly personal story in that, uh, like Nigel, I completely agree that, that that profit in the world in which we live, in the way in which this the the world works, is really yeah. important. Um, and uh, and I say that in the context of having run three charity organisations in the UK before I moved into the corporate world and. Uh, I thought long and hard about whether I wanted to make that transition and what it meant to me and whether what impacts it would would have on me because it it wasn't a motivation to ju just go into a big corporate. There had to be a lot more in it for me than that from the world that, in which I'd come from. Um, and it's to, to Kevin's point, it is about being part, having the opportunity to influence being part of the answer. You know, when we go back full circle to the beginning of the conversation about what big and small can bring to this, and the general conclusion was we need everybody, all that we've got in the armory, everyone playing their part, doing their bit, co contributing and working collaboratively as best we can, because we all bring different things to this. And so that's where big organisations, big corporate organisations who maybe have seen to be part of the problem over a long period of time and have are making this transition uh, are, are real opportunities to have influence and, and, and make a difference. And to my point at the beginning, I think if these companies, whichever sector they're in, because it's not just energy companies, there's a lot of carbon yeah. in the world that needs to be removed of all large and small. Uh, and the, the, where a lot of this lives, it's really important that these organisations do a damn sight more than just say they're going to take some action. And we're out of time. You know, we need to go faster on this journey. So. You cannot exclude these organisations. That's foolhardy, um, and we won't achieve what we need to hold them to account. Absolutely, you should, and you should be encouraging transparency. You should be encouraging and challenging where you don't see the answers coming through. And that's why, you know, I, I was working for an organisation in the public interest in my last role, uh, making the industry work work harder and faster and do better. And now I'm on the inside of that very firmly, being able to influence that and, and have hopefully some some value to bring. Uh, Adriana, had time to think? Yeah, a little bit. Um, OK, so I I wanted to emphasize that I think the public, the general public uh, or as as general public is really hard to really understand um, if those statements regarding net zero and going into renewables let's say from the big companies are um actually genuine or that so-called greenwashing i think as a professional it's a very personal choice to join the big armor and and be able to move and, and get traction or the smaller ones to bring innovation is very personal I, and i think no one is we should never point at each other's um, um, because we've decided to do this or that. Um, I do agree with Louise and, and something uh, you've mentioned at the beginning of the call that you, we should not ignore the big companies. There's been a lot of money involved, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of investment that where are those people going? Where are those jobs? Um, yeah. So we need to consider the small companies. So in a way, if new young professional, if no one joins those big companies, who who's going to take care of that, I guess? So... Um, I, um, we all need to make our decisions. It's a very personal one, um, but we should never ignore the, the big ones. And I guess just seeing that they are putting the effort on changing, it's, I guess, a start. So uh, Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sir, your final words. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so quite recently, I finally got to the bottom of what's the difference between a net zero carbon target and a carbon neutral target. And yeah, from what I understand, net zero, net zero, 
target means deep decarbonization engineering solutions actually decarbonizing, whereas carbon neutrality means that you can entirely achieve your target just by buying a, a, a load of credits. Yeah. So I don't think personally I'd want to work for a company that has a carbon neutral uh, target. I, I think that's that's kind of winging it. Uh, but net zero, I mean, targets are needed, right? Whether it's PR or, or, or not, you, you need to set targets. But I also I also see a huge shift in narratives, really from what maybe was a PR activity. There is such a push from the entire ecosystem. I mean, today we see demand from customers. You know, for example, we are we, we, we service a lot of BP's oil rigs in Caspian Sea. You know, BP knocked on our doors and asked if you were, what are you doing to decarbonize? You know, otherwise we may want to choose another one. And we we're like, okay, we need to do something about it. Investors, there's no way to secure, you know, reasonable financing at good interest rates unless you have these targets. Uh, small customers, big customers, uh, that it's, it's just the whole ecosystem slowly working. Well, not actually slowly, the, the entire ecosystem is really accelerating in that push to net zero, which is fantastic to see. Well, we're out of time, but thanks guys. Uh, Kevin, Pieter and Adriana, brilliant. The future is secure. And old donkeys like myself, I won't say Louise or, or Nigel, but certainly for me, <laughs> I've learned what a Python is tonight, of all things. So thank you very much. Um, I think that we've agreed that generally you're all very nice people and you think the world will be very good, which I think is a good place to be. So thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this session. Now, for those of you who are in London tomorrow, it's real. Yes. International Energy Week is taking place in person, so you can come along. There'll be some great speakers. Uh, there'll be the boss of Octopus Energy, uh, the boss of Total. Uh, we'll have, I think, Louise King of his speaking. I'm not sure about that. Is that right? Is that right? Um, and, and Jane McNaughton. So a fantastic day. And uh, many thanks uh, to, to BP who've been uh, sponsoring this session so thanks very much for that hope you've enjoyed it hope you've really had a good time make sure you ask the questions and uh just before we go here's a little video of what those young people that you've seen today the generation 2050 uh feel about uh what they want and what they said uh, after they showed this video at cop 26 hope you enjoy it have a good evening I think in this in this environment, I think uh, uh, change has to come far faster than where it's been coming. And I can see the differences in climate, the differences that we've found over the years. I think it's really important that we're doing everything we can do to reduce our carbon footprint. I'm concerned that we're not doing enough now. We probably need to get there quicker than we're moving at the moment. I hope we will move quick enough, and we certainly need to move quicker than we are now. So we've got to learn from that generation coming through, and by, by taking the learnings, how do we meaningfully uh, apply that into to daily business? We see what's happening with climate change, and we've all got a part to play. Since it's not about switching conventional energy off, because we can't do that. I think that anything we can do that will have a wide-reaching effect on, on, on the world is something that's worth doing. It will take time, yeah, but certainly what we're doing with uh, offshore wind, that's big steps forward in, in reduction of carbon. What I've seen, very strong foundations are laid. Now it's really starting to build on that. The, the changes that are going to come, this is the first of them, and maybe one of the biggest, but it's not going to be the last. Nature will start showing the world what has to happen and you know, when you start seeing nature taking over and showing people what's actually happening then you do start seeing a bigger response. You can't go backwards, all you can do is start now and we need to be starting now.